Like every decade, the last 10 years were meant to see the rise of a new power in football. Previously, Nigeria, the USA and Russia had been mooted for a climb to the pinnacle of the game, but the Chinese Super League seemed better placed than most, with huge state and corporate investment behind it. With the stated aim of building a division to rival the best in the world, and a national team capable of taking the World Cup trophy to Beijing, the division began to flex its financial muscle in the 2010s, and when Alex Teixeira turned down Klopp's Liverpool in 2016 in favour of Jiangsu Suning, European football fans began to worry that the wages on offer would see talent drain from the traditional top leagues. But just five years on and months after winning their first men's Super League title, Jiangsu have announced that they will cease operation of both their men's and women's teams, throwing the league into chaos. According to The Guardian, 16 clubs across China's top three divisions have now folded in the last year, and more could be set to follow, with Shandong Luneng kicked out of the Asian Champions League because of unpaid wages and Tianjin Tigers struggling to cover costs after corporate owners pulled funding. But just what has gone wrong in the CSL, and what does this mean for the future of Chinese football? On this week's EFD Explained, we went looking for answers. The modern CSL is barely a decade old, emerging from a cloud of match-fixing and gambling scandals in the late 2000s with the aim of breaking the hegemony of European football, and with new role models. Heavy investment at Man City and Paris Saint-Germain had enabled those teams to compete with football's established super clubs, and the CSL's theory was that they could do the same, tempting elite players and coaches to China with high wages and thereby increasing the marketability and ultimately the profitability of the division. Unfortunately, there were flaws in both the theory and the execution. Unlike other top leagues, the CSL had no global stars to draw in viewers, no historic clubs, and didn't have the advantage of a language spoken across the world, like French, Spanish or English. And when teams tried to address the first issue by spending big on name players and coaches, they mostly succeeded with stars who were already past their peak, with Didier Drogba arriving in Shanghai at 34 and Carlos Tevez making the same move at 32. The only true exceptions were Oscar and Alex Teixeira, but both cost over the odds. While reports of the obscene wages handed to middling players like Ezequiel Levetsi and Jovinho made the CSL the subject of scorn, not admiration. There was also a conflict of interest in the bedrock of the system. The state invested heavily in the CSL, but while corporations were predictably concerned with making a profit from the sport, Chinese President Xi Jinping saw the league as a way of improving domestic players and building an elite national side, with the aim of both hosting and winning a World Cup by 2050. For a time, it seemed like both desires could be served by a prospering domestic division, but before long, the cracks began to show. Initially, the Chinese FA's belief was that bringing foreign players and managers to the CSL would be good for domestic players and managers too. With improved training standards, role models and competition, Chinese footballers would have the necessary tools to develop into elite players, which in turn would see more transfers to top clubs and steadily enhance China's standing in the sport. However, just like the English FA, the Chinese authorities soon began to question that plan, and in 2017 took drastic steps to limit the cash flowing out of the CSL and the talent flowing in. They imposed a 100% tax on transfer fees for foreign players, capped salaries at £2.6 million, and set limits for wage bills overall at £66 million, about the same as Crystal Palace. But they didn't stop there. Last year, it was decreed that sponsor names should be removed from club names and crests, a rule which saw 12 of the league's teams rebrand themselves. The aim was to reduce corporate spending in the game and make the clubs more appealing to foreign investors. But it couldn't have come at a worse time. Despite being a global business with European football valued at around £25 billion as an industry, owning a football club is not a great way to make money. Though teams often gain value year on year, that rarely turns into profit, with few clubs producing enough revenue to offset their huge outlays on wages and transfer fees. So the main reasons to buy a club are 1. To use it to promote another business which does make a profit, and 2. To sell it on to someone else for more money at a later date when improved TV deals or success on the pitch have made it a more valuable commodity. So when the new rules came into effect, option one was almost entirely off the table, and the corporations which owned Chinese clubs were neither allowed to sell nor able to find buyers, due to the financial crisis caused by COVID-19. That meant clubs became a burden, not a boon, to their owners, something Suning especially could ill afford. One of China's largest retail firms, Suning have made splashy moves in football over the last few years, trying to sign Gareth Bale for Jiangsu in 2019 and purchasing Inter Milan, 
but that's covered up accounting problems behind the scenes. According to The Athletic, the firm's share price has halved since 2018, and a sequence of rescue plans ended in failure, leading Suning to sell off 23% of their assets to the Chinese state in early 2021. In that context, it's foolish to focus on the high-investment, low-yield business of football, especially with fans banned from Stadia during the pandemic and Suning instead have rededicated themselves to their tried and tested retail business, which is also suffering from the effects of COVID but is more capable of generating a quick profit, just as other companies have ditched their football interests to try and stay afloat. Without the disease, the league might have struggled on in its attempts to become a global player in the game, but the government's queasiness at the money pouring into the sport and out of China meant collapse was always on its way. To be honest, talking about the Chinese Super League as having failed is a Eurocentric way of looking at things. It has failed to break into the world's top five leagues, but that doesn't mean that football will cease to exist in China. Government interference may have made it impossible for Chinese clubs to attract world-class talent, but the positive effects of the investment in the sport will continue to be felt for decades. The 100% tax on foreign transfers we mentioned earlier was used to fund youth development across the nation as part of a 35-year plan to improve football's standing in China and China's standing in the football world. And Xi Jinping aims to have 50,000 academies in place by 2025 and a football pitch for every 10,000 Chinese by 2030, which, in a country of 1.4 billion, means 140,000 fields. As well as investing in players and coaches, the CSL bubble saw referees of international standing like Mark Plattenberg and Milorad Mazic, who refereed the 2018 Champions League final, brought to China in an attempt to improve the officiating in the country's football pyramid and to help quash the sport's reputation for corruption. And there has clearly been a positive effect on support, with average attendance rising from around 14,000 people per game in 2010 to around 25,000 before the outbreak of COVID last year. However, fans will be vital to the ongoing health of the sport, and the trend of corporations treating clubs as toys rather than important community institutions is only going to harm the relationship with supporters. Some fans have already paid for billboards to complain about the turmoil facing the league, and football is unlikely to grow unless there's some faith that the club you choose will still exist next season. Still, with a stated aim of getting 50 million Chinese playing the game over the next quarter century, the government has arguably the world's largest untapped football market, and the rapid spread of American players across Europe's top sides indicates how quickly advances can be made when a sensible system is married to an enormous population. If China can make the same sort of progress, it won't be long until the league and national team are prospering and by focusing on talent development, the CSL can build a foundation more stable than the whims of billionaire investors. So that's our take on the problems in the Chinese Super League, but which league do you think will be the next to become a global player? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, drop us a like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell to never miss an upload. We'll see you next time.